It's the weekly show with David J. Maloney. This week, David chats with David Page of Toto. And now, here's your host, David J. Maloney. On tonight's show, we've got a really special guest. With such hits as Hold the Line, Rosanna, and Africa, and numerous credits in between, he has been responsible for some of the most popular and enduring songs of his era. And his session work with some of the greatest names in music has ensured that his place in history is set in stone. Here to chat about his incredible career is the founding member of Toto, David Page. So don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Our featured guest tonight is responsible for some of the most famous songs of his era. And as founding member of the band Toto, he has ensured his imprint on music history will never be forgotten. Not to mention his output as a studio musician for some of the biggest names in music history. Here to chat about all his wonderful years in the band Toto and his new debut solo album, Forgotten Toys, is none other than Toto founding member David Page. David, welcome to the show. Hey, how are you out there? Doing dandy. So I know creativity runs in your family. How much influence would you say your dad had on the kind of artist that you became? My father had a lot to do with uh, what I became. Uh, he had a major influence in me when I was young. He was a jazz pianist. So from the age of five on, I can remember hearing him play jazz piano while he was writing arrangements for people like Ella Fitzgerald, Mel Torme, and... Uh, uh, Ray Charles. So uh, it was around the house all the time and really good music too that was popular. Uh, it was on the radio. You could hear it. And so uh, I got tuned into the radio and how to make uh, records for uh, uh, the radio and uh, just a general great music through my father, who was a really a legend uh, as a, a, a ranger, as an orchestra arranger and uh, um I can say he was, I, I studied under his tutelage for many years, uh, watching him write arrangements and helping him out. And uh, it was a magical experience. Now, it, it, like you said, he was, he was pretty much a legend in jazz. I'm curious if there was any particular reason why you didn't follow in that genre specifically. It required a certain amount of dexterity and commitment. I was uh, more of a, into rock and roll. Uh, and I was dabbling to jazz, but you have to play jazz 24 seven to be a good jazz player. So, uh, I didn't have that commit. I didn't have that commitment. And, uh, uh, but I still love playing dabbling at jazz to this very day. I still practice piano and still play a little bit of jazz, but I, I didn't want to do anything. I couldn't be really great at. And I knew that I could, I knew for some reason I couldn't master the art of jazz piano playing. So I, I delved into, jumped into rock and roll with both feet. Was your dad ever concerned about you being a musician as well, or did he know that you'd kind of find a way to be able to support yourself like he did? He was very, very concerned the, because he's a professional and, uh, you know, professional, as a professional, he didn't want to have to be uh, making excuses for his son who wasn't a good, very good player, you know? So he, uh, he had a look, few serious talks with me about knuckling down and uh, just taking the piano lessons seriously. So I studied uh, classical piano for four or five years, uh, playing seven days a week, three hours a day practicing. And uh, this helped me to, to achieve a sound and a dynamic that I wouldn't have had before. And also technique helped my technique. So I was able to play on records. By the time I got out of high school, I was doing sessions. So, and, and like you said, your father really did work with some of the biggest names of his era. What did that make life like for you as a kid? I mean, did you comprehend how special it all was or did it just feel like normal life as a kid because you didn't know any different? It felt like normal life, but occasionally there were special circumstances where my dad would be called to say the Greek theater and they would, uh, uh, someone would be in concert like a Sammy Davis Jr. And they'd put a spotlight on my father. So I knew that he was a very important man. They made him stand up, stand up out of the audience. But uh, other than that, he was just our, my father. And uh, I used to sharpen his pencils and uh, make sure he had plenty of erasers and kept quiet most of the time I was in the room with him. Now, now did I get this right that you, the uh, Pacaros and Steve Lukather all went to the same high school? I mean, were you guys friends in high school? They all went to the same high school. I went to a different high school. I went to a place okay. called Chaminade, which was an all boys 
college prep school in the West Valley. Well, they were in the Eastern uh, mid, mid Valley, uh, went to Grant High School, all the rest of the Bercaros and Lugather. And then each of you guys, as I understand it, had some of your own successes prior to Toto. And, and I, I know you were involved with Boss Skagg's five-time platinum album, Silk Degrees. How did that opportunity get, come about? That happened, thank you, thanks to Jeff Bercaro, who I'm very grateful for. Uh, he was, Boss Skaggs was producing an album by a guitarist named Les Dudek, who played with the Allman Brothers. And uh, it was a blues album, and they needed a keyboard player. So Jeff, who was my friend, and we played a lot together, been, had been doing some sessions, uh, recommended me. And that's how I met Boss Skaggs, who was looking to do a collaboration on his next album. And I raised my hand for and volunteered. And Jeff uh, told him that I was, would be the, the best candidate for a, a, a collaboration. So we sat down at a piano, grand piano, and wrote most of the Silk Degrees album. When was the first time you guys talked about putting your own band together, for, you know, putting together Toto? We always talked about it when we left high school and Jeff and I went on the road uh, with other artists. We talked about putting the band back together someday, the high school band, you know, or having a band uh, of some sort some configuration. So uh, uh, as we kept playing on the road, we, we met David Hungate, and then we brought uh, Steve Bercaro in, who was ch traveling with Gary Wright. We brought him in and we were the Boss Skaggs backing band for a while, um, which uh, entailed uh, uh, myself, Jeff Bercaro, uh, David Hungate, and Steve uh, Bercaro. So we had a little bit, uh, uh, a few of the components for Toto, right there. And then after that album hit big, I decided like a natural evolution uh, to move on to doing our own thing. Um, walk us through Toto One. I, I believe you composed the majority of that album, right? I did, because I had, I think I was right, I had been writing longer than anybody else. And uh, there were, the, the band wasn't, hadn't collaborated, we hadn't started collaborating at that point too much, but, uh, the uh, the uh, first song, Child's Anthem, came out of my classical upbringing uh, with piano. And so I, w I wanted to do something different on Toto. I wanted to start out with an instrumental that kind of gave me the flavor for what was supposed to come. And then we had orchestra on it. My dad conducted the orchestra with French horns and strings. And it was a re really a, 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 maj a powerful event when we did that and uh, uh, we, st we played it live and it went over live very well too. Did, did you feel like when you were writing, what, what your writing was special or did it feel like work at the moment? In other words, did, it, did, it, did you have any inkling that it was as, as you know, gonna be as good I, as it I felt like I felt like it had the potential to be special. And I felt, of course I hadn't, didn't have a, um, um, my track record was in Boss Gags before then, but. This was, I felt confident that I, we could make these uh, songs come alive because of the musicianship in the band that I had. They were very great and, and brought a lot to the table, you know. Toto 1 and Toto 4 were albums pretty much on constant rotation for me. 4 still blows my mind at what you guys were able to accomplish with that record. You had yeah. a heavy influence on that album. Did anything feel different in the studio working on that record? I mean, did you have any inkling you were making an album that would go like quadruple platinum? We did, the first song that we finished was Rosanna. And that gave us uh, an inkling of uh, what was, what the state, the bar had been set for that record. So, and there was a lot of, I have to say, there's a lot of collaboration on that album too. So you're hearing a diverse, diverse band uh, uh, co-writing together on that album. And uh, it had a lot of different styles on it too, as well. And we were able to use the LSO, the London Symphony Orchestra, on a cut called Afraid of Love, which was to me a, um, a, tr uh, a landmark piece for us. Uh, I think McCartney's uh, Live and Let Die had come out and I'd heard the orchestra on it. And I really was uh, uh, pining to get uh, 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 the LSO on um, uh, the record. And, and I know you had sole writing credit on Rosanna, and 
and and and I want to talk a little bit more about you know that I, I down later in some of the other questions about you know how that song is is set up and and the critical claim that it got. What yeah. was the create? What was the creation story of that song? I, I know there have been people who said Roseanne Arquette is 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 yeah. that where where that originates from? I use it didn't originate from her. It was originated from another from a, my first high school sweetheart that I had, but I didn't have a name for it yet. I had the whole song written. And Rosanna walked in the room and I met her and I just fell in, you know, she was adorable. And uh, so I, I, like everybody else that met her, had a crush on her. And uh, I used her name because it fit perfect for the song. So uh, that's how that happened. And uh, other than that, I was really influenced by uh, uh, Tom Bell and the Philadelphia sound, like the Spinners and the OJs. Which comes, which is that bridge that goes, not quite a year since she went away. That part right there. Uh, that was influenced, and I wanted to just show a little bit of diversity, diversity in the in the kinds of uh, sections there were as far as the musical musicality of it. And I thought that the band just performed brilliantly uh, with this keyboard solo, Steve Ricaro, myself, and uh, uh, Steve Lugather's guitar solo, and then. Uh, of course, Jeff Carl's wonderful drum intro and in the big jam fest at the very end. And it's interesting because that song does have it's got it's got kind of the keyboard and the guitar solo. And those are things I don't think at that time you heard. I mean, you'd you'd ha have one in a song, but you, I was right. it was one of the first songs that I know that had kind of two. And in that kind of way, I mean, now you have bands like Rush, and, and, you know, and, 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 YYZ, they were, and they'll do all that stuff. Absolutely. In fact, they were right in the middle of the song. Uh, made it different too, you know, but I, but they were so unbelievably musical that uh, it fits, you know. If, if you pull just anyone off the street and ask them to name Toto songs, many would probably just throw out Africa first. What do you yeah. think was the secret sauce in that song? Was it the rhythm, a specific hook, the, a particular I think, the I, think the, I think it was the hypnotic rhythm. And I think it was the fact that there was a, uh, uh, it, it had some interesting changes harmonically to it. I think that it was a little quirky uh, lyrically and uh, uh, different, but people liked the way it sang. And uh, uh, I think there was just something different about it that made it so it wasn't like anybody else you'd ever heard. Uh, it was a, almost a global, global music uh, before global music was around. And uh, um, it, I think that's that's what made it so uniqueness. Some don't realize until they actually see Toto live that you sing the verses in the song. How did you guys pick who would sing what on that song? And is it well, true that the song almost didn't make the album? It's true the song almost didn't make the album. Uh, Bobby Kimball was uh, um, recruited to uh, and asked or asked to do the the chorus vocals because he was the high singer in the band. But everybody else, including Bobby, Lukather, and uh, both tried to do the verses. And it was so wordy and a little bit complicated for their style of singing that I was the only one that could actually sing my own words that I had written. So I was the low man in the totem pole. So I got to sing it. And uh, it's funny how things turn out. You know, that ended up being our number one record. And uh, uh Again, it wasn't uh, supposed to go on the album. It was an 11th hour uh, song that was written. Uh, we had the whole album done. And I, I had came up with this uh, verse and this chorus on Africa and asked Jeff Ricardo to write a special beat for it, a hypnotic beat that would uh, be indicative of South Africa. And uh, he came up with something really special. And... Uh, uh, again, that album, uh, everybody kept telling me to save it for my solo record, uh, Africa, which is a which is a polite way of telling you it's not going on our record, you know. So uh, I'm very happy that it made it. And uh, it's been a, a, um, a real landmark song, uh, iconic song in Toto's live repertoire as well. And some people think the song has a romantic meaning, but as I understand it, the song is just truly about Africa, correct? Well, yes, but there's some romance involved. There's a guy's, uh, the, I think a, the protagonist is discovering himself, and I think he's torn between uh, the con uh, working in Africa 
and having a, a, a personal life with a, with a mate, finding a mate, you know what I mean? So uh, I think he's uh, conflicted and uh, that's about all I have to say about that. Is there a particular meaning behind bless the rains down in Africa? Well, the way I got that was because I'd gone to but the all boys uh, college prep I'd gone to was run by um, uh, brothers from a seminar. And some of them had been social workers in Africa before they came uh, back uh, to, to California. And they said, uh, I said, what did, kind of, what did you do? What was it like down there? And they said, well, we, uh, we would do, go things like bless the village. They bless babies. They bless the crops when they grow. And sometimes they built, if, it, if it wasn't raining and when it finally rained, they'd bless the rain. And so I kind of got that from uh, that message from them. And I thought it was, it just came out when I was singing the song, I just started singing the chorus and these lines just kept, they just kept pouring out of me. So uh, I just let them, I didn't deny it and uh, let it happen magically. It just kind of flowed. Looking back, which is your personal favorite total album? Or is that like kind of trying to choose which child is your favorite? It really is, you know. I'd, I'd be lying if I didn't say I have a, a, a personal affinity for the very first album. But I think the finest work to date is on Total Four album. I think is all in all a really great album as albums go. It's, it's a total album, you know. And I think it has good production on it. I think it has the songs are very good. It's very exemplary of how Total sounds. Is that album? I, I'm I'm curious if you knew which album or song was your dad's favorite, being as such an accomplished musician himself. Did he have one? Did he ever tell you? I think he liked uh, "Won't Hold You Back." He worked on that with James Newton Howard and myself, and he helped uh, arrange the uh, strings and the uh, and the uh, woodwinds and the harp and all the extra al- instruments on it, along with James Newton Howard and myself. And uh, I think he loved the fact we used the LSO on it. How did Hold the Line fall into place? Hold the Line fell into place. I had just moved away from home and got my first apartment. And I got, uh, it was really small, so I could only fit a little upright piano in there. And the, the first thing I started playing when I got it was I sat down and started playing the Hold the Line riff. And I must have played it for two or three days because people were pounding on my door to stop playing the, this riff. And so I finally finished writing a little verse for it. And we decided to go down and audition the song to the band who we just hired Bobby Kimball and uh, Lukather was there and David Hungate and Jeff and myself. And we played Hold the Line and we played it just about how it sounds on the record the first time we played it. It sounded good, it sounded just like that. And uh, we knew we had something magical and that song, uh, we should record the song. Looking back, you were in on some of what I would consider some of the greatest studio sessions in history. One that comes in mind involves you, Steve, Paul, McCartney, uh, Michael Jackson, George Martin, Quincy Jones, working on The Girl Is Mine. What sticks out to you about that session in particular? What I remember was Linda McCartney was there and she had a huge camera with a huge, well, small camera with a huge lens on it. And she was shooting right over my shoulder at the session while I was trying to play. She was right to the right of me, shooting right in back of me at everybody. So I remember her and I remember Paul standing around, uh, smiling and kind of giving this musical inspiration and, and uh, a couple of little ideas and stuff. Uh, and other than that, I had my head buried in the arrangement. And uh, it, was, it was a magical experience. I can't, can't deny that. We've, I've had, my son had the opportunity to kind of fist bump him once. And usually I'm not phased too much by celebrity, but when you meet somebody like Paul McCartney, it's almost kind of like meeting the queen, right? I mean, there's, there's yeah. a different, even, even for folks who, I mean, you're looked up to, you're somebody who somebody s- people see as a celebrity, but do you as a celebrity still sometimes see other people like that? I mean, like just almost unworldly, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's people, there's colleagues of mine and lots of musicians that that are very casual about seeing stars and, and other musicians and stuff. I I think they have certain people have that rarefied air that they live in. Uh, your Michael Jackson is one of them. Uh, Paul McCartney. Whenever you meet a Beatle, you know you're in the presence of greatness. And uh, 
whenever you meet a Rolling Stone, I feel the same way about that. You know, I got to play work on Keith Richards' solo record, and that was a real uh, pinch me moment. You know, I mean, a real bucket list thing for me. So I think uh, Elton John has that. I think Cher has that. I think Barbara Streisand has that. So there are the elite of the elite that still, to me, I feel like a fan, a super fan when I'm with them. And I have to remind myself that I have a job to do and that I'm, I'm working, you know? So, yes, I, I do have people I look up to as stars. That's our show for tonight. Thank you so much for watching. A special thanks to David Page of Toto for joining us. He will be back next week for part two of our interview. Stay safe, everyone.